This is Curative Design, and I'm Arun Matthews. A few months ago, while listening to a favorite podcast called Film Spotting, the subject of introducing kids to compelling cinema arose, and I have to say, I was intrigued. Specifically, which decidedly non-kid-friendly films would prove to be a good experience for children to watch? The understanding was that, in exchange for the occasional naughty word, kids could have a chance to feel the thrill of a giant boulder chasing Indiana Jones, be spooked in a good way as Elliot slowly discovered that an alien named E.T. had moved in, or possibly feel the thrill of a Titan's touchdown when Denzel Washington's racially integrated football team scored. That was the promise, anyhow. After much discussion, we decided that Ron Howard's masterful telling of the Apollo 13 mission would be our pick for our two kids, both aged under 10. And it went down like gangbusters. In a nutshell, the film tells the tale of the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission where three astronauts experience a catastrophic mechanical failure in the midst of their spaceflight to the moon. It is a masterclass on watching how intelligent people come together in times of crisis and literally kludge together a series of increasingly innovative workarounds and solutions to bring three astronauts home safely. One particular sequence struck a chord with me and ultimately became the reason for this essay. Some would consider it possibly a throwaway moment, not necessarily pivotal to the narrative, and yet upon a repeat viewing of the film, I began to appreciate why Howard chose to include it. The scene that made me pause and consider what a culture of excellence really means. Gary Sinise plays Ken Mattingly, the original Apollo 13 command module pilot, who ultimately gets taken off the mission due to an exposure to rubella. Prior to this happening, we are given a glimpse of NASA's simulation training process. Mattingly, Lovell, and Hayes, the original members of the crew, are shown in the confines of a cramped simulator, having already spent what appears to have been hours. The folks on the other side of the simulation decide to throw a thruster failure at the crew, and Mattingly is able to compensate and still meet the mission objectives. Upon exiting the simulator, Hanks, played by Lovell, aptly describes the experience as three hours of boredom followed by seven minutes of sheer terror. As they celebrate and debrief, and while the backup crew starts entering the module for their turn, Mattingly, the recipient of all the praise, turns to his team and states that he was unhappy with how much fuel his compensatory maneuvers had used up, and he wants to try it again. There is a moment of silence as everyone looks to Jim, the commander. Everyone is tired. Jim is tired. Bill Hayes states that they have to be up prior to dawn the following morning, but Sinise says Mattingly gently counters that their rate of turn is still a little too slow and that he really thinks they should work it again. Jim's response is as simple as it is decisive. Well, let's get it right then. That moment. That moment defines what a true culture of excellence is. That scene, so lovingly crafted by Howard, to me, distills down everything that is impressive about NASA during the years of the Apollo space missions. An earnest desire for continuous improvement. Yes, simulation training is effective and awesome, but perhaps more importantly, it is in the pursuit of perfection that we catch a glimpse of this thing called excellence. There would have been a thousand very reasonable excuses not to climb back into that simulator and not hone those approaches. But that's the thing, isn't it? Perfection, or even striving for it, isn't reasonable. It's a selfish act, and good leaders like Lovell recognize and nurture this. In my world of healthcare, I see glimpses of excellence, but it appears unevenly distributed. I see surgeons who, while being very fastidious about their equipment or whether a sterile field is broken, also balk at the need for 100% hand hygiene to reduce healthcare-related infections. I've seen physicians who are diligent with subtle changes in the way nurses interpret their orders, turn around and perform incomplete discharge medicine reconciliations via telephone. 
I've seen nurses refuse to ask for help when they're feeling overwhelmed and also hold back when the physician comes by on rounds. I've seen flawed and or sometimes non-existent handoffs between hospitalists or schedules that don't anticipate high census days. And lastly, I've seen both ego and personality get in the way of good communication. Keep in mind that these tend to be exceptions, but to the patient in the hospital bed, it is hard to reconcile with some aspect of their care being poor because of an exception. The question I struggle with is this, how can we learn from other industries this pursuit of a culture of excellence? How do we strive to foster it without burning out the frankly incredible men and women of our healthcare system? Sadly, I don't have any great insights, but I strongly believe that a combination of empathy or leadership training early in a clinician's career is key. I also believe that it only takes a few individuals to start the process of cultural transformation in an organization. Under stressful situations, people look to how the leaders respond, and the good news is that a good number of these situations can be simulated or worked through via role play so that when they occur in real life, both leaders and staff have a playbook for tackling them. Disruptive physician in the OR? No problem. Impaired clinician on the nursing staff? We've got this. And once you've got the winds of cultural change start to sweep through an organization, the effects can be outstanding. Ownership. I believe that when people are passionate and diligent about getting better at the task of taking care of patients every day, and that they are encouraged to do so, the end result is that they feel that they are personally responsible for their hospital and the patients that receive care in it. Circling back, I would challenge you to consider using the medium of film as a wonderful way of holding up a mirror to our own lives. It is one of the reasons I watch films, to be inspired. This was one of those instances where true events inspired the creation of art, which in distilling the heroic efforts of NASA to bring back their people safely, may one day inspire future generations to do the same in moments of crisis. I realize that at this point, many of the more subtle detailing and nuance will be lost in my kids, but the hope is that when they are a little older, they'll revisit some of these films, seeking out insights for this thing called life. For more reading on this, be sure to check out the wonderful book by Ty Burr called The Best Movies for Families. And lastly, my gratitude to Adam Kempinar and Josh Larson of the Film Spotting Podcast for their bold suggestion to challenge my kids and indeed our family with some alternative entertainment fare. Brava! This is Curative Design, and I'm Arun Matthews.